Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Adams. I'm a specialist solutions, solutions architect with uh, AWS or Amazon Web Services, and I'll be presenting deep learnings at the edge. I uh, hope everybody's staying safe out there, and welcome to the um, Embedded Linux Conference in a virtual environment. So a couple things here is uh, just going to go over the agenda of what we're going to be talking about today. So there's a lot of interest around edge computing or, or edge capabilities, which is taking you know what we normally see as either data center centric or cloud centric and taking it out to the edge. Uh, so we're going to go through some of the different use cases for why you might want to use the edge. Uh, we'll then go through some of the implementation patterns, what we have seen with our customers and just you know through years of experience, how these things actually can get deployed, some things that are good and some things that are bad, so that we can sort of highlight those. Uh, next, we'll go through you know what happens when um, things go wrong. These are devices that are out in the field, so unlike you know in a data center or in a controlled environment, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, but there's a lot of ways that we can also address that through edge computing uh, capabilities. And then finally, we'll kind of just uh, you know pull it all back and say that you know if you want to go down and start doing edge, as how can you leverage what you know existing practices you have in your IT or your OT organization and, and go ahead and do that. A couple things is that um, we're going to be taking questions at the end, uh, as mentioned, and we'll do this through the chat mechanism. If we don't get um, all of the questions answered, uh, we do have um, the AWS booth that you can go to in the gold hall and ask other uh, solutions architects. But having said that, we've got a lot to go through, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. So before we actually jump into our edge cases, this one to um, go a little bit over architecture terminology. Um, as a solutions architect in the IoT space at, at AWS, um, I use the word cloud a lot because that's what we work with, you know, cloud, cloud, cloud. But when I talk about cloud as sort of a holistic view is, you know, consider this to be, you know, either you know, your, your cloud platform you're using, or if you're not using cloud services, you know, the, the data center, your on-prem or on-premises environment, wherever you've got sort of, you know, central control and have got services that are available 24-7. When I talk edge, I'm basically talking about discrete devices that are at the edge. Uh, this can be one or many devices, but it'll be basically a combination of both you know, hardware and software and then multiple ones you know, out there. Um, the reason we like to sort of you know, break these up is that when you talk about cloud, that's where essentially you've got a lot of your elastic capability uh, where you can have services on demand and uh, that when you want to basically scale out or scale back in, you can do so in a very fast fashion. When we talk about sort of the, the edge component, and I'll talk about sort of the hardware and software, essentially it's a combination of hardware along with software that you bring, an operating system, system packages, and then your own components that make up an edge device. Uh, this can be either a physical device, or in some instances, it could actually be a virtual type of environment. So it could run on top of you know, VMware or Hyper-V. So let's talk about the edge a little bit. So I mentioned it, there's a lot of interest into it. And you know, if we, we take a look back, you know, what edge is, is you, know, you can see sort of the terms in sort of an IoT. And the Internet of Things essentially comes from, I've got some type of device that's doing something you know, in the real world at the edge. The way we like to kind of you know, say it is that if you can address one or more of what we call the laws of the edge, is that it might be a good candidate for how you want to do edge computing or um, you know, deep learning at the edge. First one, laws of physics. Is that you know the speed of light? Um, you know, basically, it's not just a good idea, but you know, it is a law. And that if you've got things that you want to do, such as that you know, a closed loop operation, such as you know, automatic braking, if you detect you know a an object or a person in front of you, you want those to happen very quickly. You want those to happen in microseconds or even single digit millisecond latency. And if you had to take that data from a local device and send it out to the cloud, um, you're not going to be able to achieve that. So that's a good example of essentially, um, you know, of how we can say that, you know, if there's operations that, that should take place locally, that's a good candidate. The second one is around economics. As devices are now starting to go out into the environment, they're, they're leaving the hardwired um, Ethernet and Wi-Fi environments to cellular or even to like LoRaWAN or other types of low power WAN environments, if we don't have network connectivity that can basically cover the globe, even from satellites, um, you know, communication, but it comes at a cost. It's either that you're going to have a significantly reduced amount of bandwidth, you're going from you know, megabytes per second or megabits per second to potentially bytes per second, or that the cost to transfer data is going to be significantly more expensive. 
uh, transmitting one gigabyte of data on your broadband provider's network is going to be a lot less cheap than a one gigabyte across you know, an LTE or a 5G type of connection. And then finally, it's kind of the law of the land, is that there are certain situations where you may want to have processing and there's, there's, there's you know, values for it, but from a regulatory or sovereignty laws, that there's limitations on what you can actually send out. A good example is if you've got edge computing inside of a, a hospital environment, it might be very good to do, to do some of those closed loop operations inside of an operating room or a patient's room, but for you know, personal identifiable information or healthcare reasons, that information should never leave the, the environment. So a couple examples we'll, we'll go through here. Common one from an edge compute is sort of like you know, a wind turbine farm. We've got a lot of very expensive devices that are in close proximity to each other, but the farm might not be in close proximity to the rest of the world, meaning that they can communicate between each other, but requires a cellular connection outbound. Um, we want to do some operations on this. We want to do predictive or preventative maintenance on each of our turbines, which requires you know, high velocity uh, checking of vibrations, for instance, and that we want to essentially emit you know, small amounts of data to the cloud to say, hey, come out to farm one, turbine number 22 for maintenance perspective. Comparing that to like the, um, the automobile of today, the modern automotive environment. Inside of an automobile, you probably have got multiple computers all communicating with each other. And these can be doing things such as the infotainment system, uh, the ability to you know, adjust temperature and controls. Um, but it also might be things such as you know, advanced driver you know, controls uh, you know, through ADAS or things like this. Automate, you know, like I mentioned with, um, you know, you know, auto braking, if there's people in front of you. Um, key thing here is that, you know, you've got a variety of different components, and you can actually include your, you know, third-party ones that need to communicate with each other, and they differ. When a car is in a garage at home, you have got a good Wi-Fi connection, but when it's out in the street, you're now going back down to like to a cellular or LTE type of connection. And then the final kind of, you know, third example here is like site inspection. Uh, very common where you might have a drone that you drive out to a remote site. This could be a refinery or an oil well or even you know, a large farm environment. You program the drone to essentially do its autonomous operation. It takes off, it zooms up to altitude, it's checking things for methane, you know, methane discharges or blight on fields, collecting a lot of very you know, intense data, you know, full motion video plus LIDAR and other types of things in an autonomous manner and then comes back to you. When it's actually in its, that sort of autonomous mode, that's where edge, you know, compute at the edge can, can do some differentiation. You, know, you might determine, oh, I see a particular thing that we're not gonna collect, but because I've inferred this, I'm not gonna collect this. So if we kind of categorize these three things together, the turbine, the automobile, and a drone site inspection against the three laws, is we can see that there's certain values that, or certain things that come into each of those that match up. So the wind turbine, is that from the physics perspective, I need to be able to do thousands of, of monitoring you know, measurements per second on vibrations. For the automobile, from the economic perspective, I want to capture a lot of video to help train my autonomous driving component, but I don't want to transmit that when it's on the road cellularly. I want to transmit that, that when I'm back into a Wi-Fi environment. And for the drone, is that there might be a corporate security policy is that you know, any data collected by a drone itself um, cannot be transmitted across the public internet has to go through a, a private connection. So when you think of your use case, think of how you can kind of tie, you know, a potential use case into three laws. And if you hit one of these, okay, if you hit two or three, that's normally a very good candidate for an edge component. So speaking of that, you know, what does an edge implementation actually look like? So I'm gonna be talking about this slide a lot. And essentially what we're saying is that, you know, starting from the bottom up, we've got hardware components, uh, we've got an operating system, system packages, and then our user packages, which are sort of the orchestrated components that come back and forth in the cloud that then add your business logic or capabilities to whatever the device is. Starting with, you know, the hardware is we may need to interact with other things such as GPUs for machine learning inference at the edge. Uh, you might want to be you know, connecting to picture sensors. You might have different types of architectures that you're running here. But this is your common hardware that you might want to expose all the way up into your edge application. From an operating system perspective, we normally see this into the three different environments. A lot of times customers will start with sort of a general purpose operating system. You know, they, they use Ubuntu or Red Hat internally. 
um, or they're doing development on a Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi OS becomes sort of a, you know, good use case. These are kind of general purpose. You're kind of, you know, manually doing updates. They're not really in sync, they're in sync with each other. The other one is sort of the embedded space from Linux is that you can use things such as, you know, Yocto or Open Embedded to build, you know, very specific and repeatable or immutable type of operating systems that can run on your, your particular devices. Um, we also see customers that are using more lean or thin or, uh, operating systems such as, you know, Alpine or BusyBox, or even in cases where you're going to sort of abstract out the entire operating system environment and use third parties such as from Belina, using the Belina OS as an underlying component for then deploying your edge capabilities. So moving up from the operating system and the system packages, there'll be a variety of these things. I won't go through you know, much detail, but just to call out is that you know, if you're running Python applications or Java apps, you're going to have to have a Java runtime or a Python interpreter for that. If it's compiled applications, you're going to have to have shared objects potentially or certain versions of glibc. Um, or you want to take advantage of you know, a very performant things such as you know, NumPy that's been you know, written with you know, underlying C runtimes that are then available to other languages. For the machine learning and the deep convoluted neural networks, these might be full-blown ones, such as you know, MXNet, CAFE, you know, TensorFlow, et cetera, or ones that are more um, refined or slimmed down to run in constrained environments, such as you know, TensorFlow uh, you know, Lite, or you know, such as you know, a Neo, you know, the, the, deep learning, the deep learning you know, runtime environment. Um, call out also from a management perspective, ensure that you have you know, something that's built into there to allow you to do remote monitoring and management as necessary. Um, you know, edge capabilities and orchestration provide some of that telemetry, but by having the ability to create a tunnel that can be outbound from the device to the cloud and then the cloud back to the device, is it allows you to do that type of remote you know, monitoring or troubleshooting as necessary, along with doing OTA updates. And then from the, the edge framework, um, this is going to depend on what you're doing. If you're a container-based shop, you know, Kubernetes or Rancher might be in a, so, a, you know, an environment to use. It might be EdgeX or KubeX or KubeEdge, or you know, our AWS IoT Greengrass, which is a fully you know, managed environment for doing you know, edge computing capabilities. So operating systems and system packages. And then on top of that, we have essentially the user packages. This is where essentially your developers or you are adding your specific value add business logic to the device to do what you want it to do. Uh, you know, machine learning at the edge, um, detecting uh, certain events and taking actions. And we normally see this happening either through you know, native applications that you develop and you're SDP or copying over to a device. Um, this may be that through it's an orchestration of multiple containers um, that you know, you're, you're doing through uh, you know, Mesos or, or Kubernetes. Or go back to the edge frameworks where you now have you know, a rich environment where you can do things such as containers or serverless you know, environments such as functions, along with other things such as you know, APIs, uh, queuing, or stream management, all capabilities at the edge. A lot of times you, you know, want to interact with that edge device locally, and we'll see that in the demo a little bit later on. So you might want to be able to build in the capability of having you know, local APIs, you know, either RESTful ones or just quick request response, or endpoints that other types of devices can then interact with if they're also working with the edge device. And then for the machine learning model, it is the ability to be able to have machine learning models downloaded and operating in the device, along with the ability to have some type of you know, closed loop or round trip operation for doing retraining and detection of drift so that you can ensure that your models are running properly. So take a look at an example of, of all these kind of in operation. So we have on the left-hand side, you know, physical camera, we have our edge device, and we have the cloud. So the first thing we do is we have a local process, a collector, that's taking in a certain type of format, you know, H.265, and it's using something like OpenCV to convert this into a frame that our inference model can actually uh, consume. It's expecting it to come in a BGR uh, format and resize to 300 by 300 pixels. Um, our inference could be a, a Python-based application, um, you know, maybe using ResNet 50 as our model and using MXNet underneath the covers. And then this is basically, it's incorporated in the training model that it's loading into. So we take in our video, which is you know, a standard uh, H.265 format. We're converting it into the format that we want. And then once the inference is done, we're only sending to the cloud 
the, the, the inference capability. So the list of the objects that detected and the bounding boxes around it. So in this particular case, you know, everything on the device is, is, is very rich in the amount of data that's being transferred back and forth. Uh, we're, we're having you know, megabits per second from the camera into our device, but we're only sending bytes or kilobytes of information based on inference out to the cloud and only things of interest. So let's take our basic example here and kind of take it to the next level. So here's where we're kind of saying, all right, for the local streaming, we'll, we can use something that's just GStreamer pipeline uh, that allows us to abstract out any type of cameras as to an input. We then bring those into our, our trans, you know, transformations to BGR and the resizing. And then in the green shaded section are all of our edge components that we're orchestrating. So we have our machine learning inference your model that's taking in the values and giving back, you know, giving back, you know, um, values back. This can either make it available to like a local web server, and we'll see that in the demo, or you might we might be doing data enrichment, which we then want to send to the cloud for a, a common uh, web platform there. Uh, it also might be that we want to take a look at um, video of interest that might be useful for retraining our model. And then on the cloud side, where we have the capability and resources to essentially manage not just one of these devices, the edge, but potentially thousands, is we may have a web server that essentially is an aggregate of all thousands of our devices that we can drill down into each one as necessary or see what the, the total aggregate is. From the machine learning train, uh, model training component is we might be getting back video snippets from different uh, views or perspectives and then doing the training of a model across you know, a large amount of instances of you know, GPU um, accelerated um, you know, machines to recreate a new model, which we can then deploy as a retrained model out to the edge to all of our devices uh, as, a, as a single deployment uh, over the air update to then have them take advantage of those new capabilities. Apologies there, my throat is getting dry. Um, just also call out, and we'll go this in a little bit further, is that there's different types of layers that we can map from the edge device back into cloud capabilities, which will help with the orchestration and automation of everything from the operating system all the way up through our machine learning models and compute functions. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, sort of transition into a demo here. So uh, before I jump over and show you this in a, in a YouTube video and sort of narrate what's happening, I want to kind of lay the land from the, the hardware perspective. So one of our partners, Tordex, uh, put together a demo of what they call sort of, you know, pasta inference. Um, what you see here is essentially a conveyor belt at the bottom. And at the center of that is we have all of our compute capabilities. On the right-hand side, we place pieces of pasta different shapes onto the conveyor belt. And then our central edge device drives the conveyor belt forward at you know, uh, a particular speed. And as, as the pasta comes underneath the camera, it does object detection to determine what type of pasta it is and what type of you know, um, you know, uh, confidence levels are there. The HDMI for the local user interface is used for a local um, you know, interface that like you know, somebody on a, on a platform would be able to see. And then we've got the Wi-Fi for cloud connectivity, which is sending that other data out to the cloud uh, for a central type of um, your presentation. So with that, I'm going to stop pre um, presenting here and go over to a YouTube video, and I'll do a little bit of narration on that. All right, now I'll go ahead and let this settle. So what we're, we're essentially seeing here before I start this is uh, one of our um, a partner managers that was going through this. So as you can see here, and I'll start the video up, is that we see the pasta on the conveyor belt, and at the center, you can see the camera that's facing down with a light, which is taking a look on that. And what he's showing right there is a system on module or, or um, system on core of an IMX8 uh, processor, which is running you know, beside the Greengrass and the inference components. And as you can see that the, the pasta comes through. And I'm going to skip forward a little bit here so we can take a look at the screen on the left. So this screen here is that local interface coming off the HDMI. So as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen is that the conveyor belt is moving at you know, certain frames per second, and we're actually seeing the pasta there. And then on the left-hand side is we're getting the inference results locally. So as the machine learning model says, ah, this is a piece of fusilli pasta or elbow pasta, it can then basically you know, increase the, the count and show what our confidence levels are for this here. 
So this is all the capabilities that's happening locally on the edge. And this can be at you know, whatever speed that we want. You know, we can take full advantage of you know, HDMI, full motion video, um, these types of things. Let me scroll forward a little bit here. And above this is another display, which essentially is showing the cloud side. So all of that data that's being collected locally is that we're only sending back a small JSON object or a small amount of information about the current state of the, the situation or of the, um, the device. And if you notice there on the, um, the left-hand side, as we'll see the pasta on current frame bump up when it sees a piece of pasta. And then there's the other portions of you know, what the, the, cert, the, the inference things are. So this is a full you know, web application workload uh, that in real time is, is seeing values coming back and then is, that is basically doing an update on the, the, the display here. So I'll go ahead and pause this and go back over to our presentation. All right, so that was basically the, the hardware that you saw here. If we were to take a look at the architecture, this one is very specific and opinionated for AWS, but it kind of demonstrates the, the same capabilities. Left-hand side is we have our device, right-hand side is the cloud. On the device side, we have AWS IoT Greengrass, which is our edge compute capability, which is orchestrating um, all of our functions and our machine learning model. The little circles in there, which have got a, a Lambda uh, symbol, are our Lambda functions. And this is sort of serverless compute uh, that we're running you know, on a local device. And this allows it to interface with the actual camera and the machine learning model to, to do the inference. The, the lines between the device to the cloud are break out into two. Uh, the top one goes into SageMaker, and that is our machine learning uh, set of services that allow you to train models and do machine learning operations. And this is where we can take back that retraining data. But then all those other boxes below, IoT Core, uh, Cognito, gate, API Gateway, CloudFront, et cetera, are all the components that make up that, that second display that we saw, which is the, um, you know, the, the overall view. And the interesting thing about this is all of those boxes, uh, we have got databases, we've got compute, we've got you know, static websites, reactive websites. These are all able to be deployed through a single click through the CloudFormation template. So just uh, you know, just the, the demo here, and I always like using YouTube because the demo guides are normally very good about this, is that um, this kind of demonstrates how you can have local capabilities on a device, and that if you want to interact with it locally, you can do so, but that you can also, through those three laws, still interact with things you know, uh, from the cloud side or your on-premises environment. So we've spoken about you know, some of the use cases for, for Edge and also what some of the patterns are. But because the devices are out in the field, I can guarantee you that there will be problems with them. As soon as you don't have the capability of touching a device to either do something to it or even reset it, that's when things go wrong. So the first one that is, is probably, I would say, 80 to 90% of issues that we see with edge computing is internet connectivity or intermittent connectivity. Um, it's very common to hear that a backhoe has taken out, you know, a certain amount of internet links for the, the Northeast United States or for the Southwest United States. Um, it's very common to see, you know, degraded, you know, uh, capabilities if there's DDoS attacks or, you know, bad routing tables and these types of things. And what that basically means is that from a cloud perspective, you may have a thousand devices out there and any one time you may only have a certain portion of your fleet that's actually active or available. So how do we actually deal with those devices or how should we deal with those devices that go from an online to offline state? Um, our, our CTO, uh, Werner Vogels, has got a saying uh, that everything fails all the time. So if you take that, that particular statement, you can design for failure and you should design for failure. Assume that whatever you put into the field, everything potentially is going to go wrong. If you design for that, then you've addressed those types of failure points. So from a connectivity perspective is, you know, consider things that, you know, if the device is in an online state, what happens if it goes offline? And what happens if it goes offline for a couple seconds, a couple minutes, or it's offline for a few hours due to a, um, you know, some type of internet outage or networking outage? Um, understand the, the interactions between the local components to the cloud back and forth so that, you know, if you are normally sending data to the cloud, and you can't because it's offline, how do you queue that data locally? Uh, conversely, think about also if you're in an offline state and you go online. You imagine from the cloud that you've got um, your deployments. You've deployed version one to all of your devices. 
Then over the course of a couple of days, you've done versions two, three, and four. But when your devices have been offline for that period of time, so when it comes back online at version one and reaches out to the cloud, do you then want to go ahead and deploy versions two, three, and four to get it up to date? Or can you go from version one all the way over to version four to complete that process? So those are some of the things to consider. And from a timing or temporal perspective, think about this in matter of minutes to potentially even years. I kind of push years out there. But uh, we do have customers, for instance, that have got shipping containers with edge devices on them. When they're actually in a port and in, in, a, in a shipping you know, container yard, they've got good you know, internet access. So they can say, you know, what's the, the, the current condition of a, of a cooling container? When those containers are actually put onto a ship and that ship is out at sea, they normally have no zero connectivity, but they're still running local edge computing operations. This might be to adjust thermostat values, uh, tracking conditions of you know, pumps and compressors. So um, when they actually you know, leave one port and enter another port, that could be a two to three week period. Um, how do you then sort of flush that data that's been collected? Do you basically just you know, blast it down a pipe and get it out there? Or do you, you, um, you sort of throttle it so that you know, other operations in the background can happen? So think about things around you know, intermittent connectivity from your device to the cloud. The other key one we see is that security constraints. Um, a well-designed edge device will always reach out to the cloud. It will never open a listening port and, and uh, you know, looking for an incoming connection. It will always be the one to establish an outbound connection to a web, to a always available service in the cloud. Um, this could be a for a variety of ports, depending on your protocols. And the actual endpoints might be different. Um, a lot of times is that you'll have a fully qualified domain name, such as, you know, my service name .it .example .com. In this case here, is that if you go to your you know, firewall people and say, can you please open the port, to, you know, port 43 to my service name at it.example.com, a lot of times they'll say, we don't do that. We don't do fully qualified domain names. We only do IP addresses. So what's the IP address associated with that name? Sometimes it might be a single IP address. In other times, especially for cloud services, that might be thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even potentially millions of IP addresses that that endpoint can you know, change over a course of time. And most times, you know, the security people are going to say, no way, we're not going to allow that to happen. So one way to address that is to actually reduce the access surface area. So instead of the attack surface area for like, you know, um, you know doing you know, security testing, is if you can reduce the amount of endpoints that a device has to get to, and through using like a VPN tunnel, you can help address that from a security perspective. Uh, the tunnel can be something that's site to site, like established from a firewall back into uh, the cloud or data center environment, or it can be a client side VPN client you know, um, you know, application that takes everything on your local device, sends it through a VPN tunnel out to a set of addresses, maybe one or two IP addresses for resiliency, and then only one port. But by doing that, this allows you and to, to convey to the security people that you know, here's a set of addresses and a specific set of ports which are, are easily accessible. There's a couple other design considerations that come into play here too. Um, on the device itself, um, design for your, your, your functionality. Um, a common thing that, you know, that I see from customers is that you may have your machine learning folk um, running Python 3.6 for all of their machine learning frameworks. Um, you know, NVIDIA, is good for, uh, NVIDIA has a good example of this with their Jetpack environment. Uh, Jetpack today, Everything is designed out of the box to run under 3.6. Uh, that's the, you know, the, the frameworks like the TensorFlow, the CUDA environment, et cetera. But you also might have some of your other developers that are writing other functionality that are using Python 3.8. And so in this case, um, consider what applications or you know, languages need to be available on your actual environment. If you're doing this from the, the, the Linux perspective you know, directly, you may want to say, all right, let's go ahead and install Python 3.6 and 3.8 and give specific you know, um, you know, paths to the applications that need this. And that's when you're, you're basically doing sort of packaging for a common type of environment. When it comes to container-based approach, you may say, all right, for our machine learning-based containers, let's build in or put in the layers for Python 3.6 to support those uh, people that are developing from that perspective. And let's use Python 3.8 for the developers that are writing other containers or microservices for, for other applications of our, our edge device. Um, other thing is we're going to be doing updates to these devices. These initially, you know, these will originate from the cloud. 
Um, there will be a deployment or a manifest of all the changes that need to be made to the local device. And these can be things, um, everything from operating system updates all the way up through our, our orchestration component. Just be sure that you have a ability to not break the device. It's very, it's very hard to unring the bell uh, once you've deployed something and you're like, oh darn, this, this is going to, to, to break this. That, that does require a truck roll or somebody you know, visiting the device. There's a lot of mechanisms out there uh, to essentially um, help uh, achieve this. Um, a good example is uh, Mender IO, for instance, has got the ability to basically have multiple partitions so that when you deploy a new version, it goes in a different partition. When it's rebooted, you know, either UFI or, or Grub itself can simply say, did I start up correctly, yes or no? And if I didn't, roll back to the, uh, the previous operation. And also try to consider, if you can, to use atomic operations or transactional changes. Um, instead of you know, deploying a command to do like an apt get update on a variety of devices, um, even if they're all at the same version and the same patch level um, from a previous apt get update, there is a potential that they can slightly get out of drift. But if you can build all of your updates into a single operation that if it, the transaction takes place completely, it's committed, otherwise you do that rollback component. So always thought, you know, it's always good to sort of consider that also. The device itself are going to go into those varying type of environments. Um, the car, uh, the, the automotive example is good that you start off in a, in a Wi-Fi connection in your garage. So you might be doing some, you know, updates to, to the uh, operating system on, on the car itself. When you're on the road and you're doing autonomous driving or other things, you may want to actually collect data that is then used for your training purposes, you know, further. So make sure that your device can understand when it goes from one state, Wi-Fi to cellular, or back again from cellular to Wi-Fi, uh, you know, once it comes back into the garage and can do the upload of all that particular data. Um, also, devices are going to be operating with other things. In the automobile, this might be with other, interacting with other ECUs. Um, in other environments, you may be talking to uh, manufacturing you know, uh, devices that put all of their data onto a Windows file share. Um, just ensure that you've got the capabilities in your device to be able to interact with other either systems or sensors you know, inside of the environment that they're deployed. And the other one also, and I should have, and when I redo this slide, I'm going to put this at the top, security is paramount. Every device out there should have a unique principle that associates that device to something in the cloud so that you can identify it. So when it does make a connection, that it can go through a uh, authentication and authorization process to identify what the device is and what capabilities it has from the cloud side. Um, these are normally you know, supported through either X509 certificates or other mechanisms. So if you can um, ensure that you've got some type of hardware-based security integration, this could be through secure elements, uh, TPMs, or other ways that if you do deploy or when you de do deploy your certificates and credentials onto a device, that you can actually ensure that they are you're protected as much as possible and that they can't be exploited. Um, but if a device uh, does get exploited or compromised and you've got detection capabilities in the cloud for that, have a mechanism to either you know, reset the device to a factory state or the ability to rotate credentials to give it you know, um, a new set of, uh, of principles to, to interoperate with. All right, so that, that pretty much goes over you know, what we see from sort of the, uh, the, the design patterns and, and how to work in, you know, when things go wrong. But one of the other key things is please leverage um, IT or your OT uh, colleagues if possible. Um, this is a common thing that we see is that um, if you're in a shop that is using, let's say, a lot of Red Hat Linux under the covers, and as an embedded developer, an edge developer, you're using a Raspberry Pi and you're using the you know, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi OS, which is a Debian type of environment, great for development. But if you're looking to actually you know, manage and deploy a device to the edge, see if you can leverage what is currently being used internally from your own IT organization. Um, you know, commonly we'll see things where you know, that you know, you're, you're set on a specific set of Linux and you've got those skills or capabilities, but it also might be that you also have got, you've built the capabilities for doing you know, updates. Consider, you know, are you reaching out to public repositories or are you going to be reaching into to private satellites or PPAs for doing your updates? Um, also, you know, if you're a Java shop, you probably have got, you know, a set of Java JREs that you're going to use and deploy. Uh, if you can align with what you have from an IT perspective, that really does help from helping manage those components. 
Now, once you have those sort of identified, is we also say that you know we, we separate sort of edge capabilities from the underlying um, you know, OS orchestration. So, you know, extending things such as using Salt, Ansible, Chef Puppet, etc., for managing the underlying operating system devices is is a good thing. Then on top of that, you can do things such as, you know, potentially using containers that you, you want to use, you know, Rancher at the Edge or Kube Edge or some type of, you know, Mesos environment for managing your container um, operating environment. Um, and then if it's a serverless type of capabilities you're deploying is, you know, you know, use things such as, you know, OpenWest, OpenFAS or, you know, IoT Greengrass to help take those, you know, servers or functions you deploy in the cloud and deploy those out to the edge. So if we move up to the next level, which is sort of the assets, these are sort of the um, the, the value add or the business logic that you're 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 adding. Uh, you might be deploying, you know, might be developing functions, a microservice-based architecture, or it might be a combination of Docker images and Docker Compose files that deploy all of your functionality at the edge. It's also the the, uh, the output from machine learning, so the machine learning model that you want to deploy to your uh, your uh, your devices, along with operating uh, system updates firmware, et cetera. Um, normally from this, you'll have an endpoint where your devices can reach back into to say, hey, do I have a new deployment? It gets the manifest of deployment information back. And then inside of that manifest will say, oh, I'm getting my functions from this particular URL or from these objects, my machine learning ones from this one, et cetera. Um, also, you know, fleet management. If you have the capability of sort of you know, managing and seeing the health and state of your devices um, overall, if IT's got a you know, solution for that, uh, you know, please use that. Same for you know, status reporting and dashboards. And then as mentioned, um, discrete device security and identity. Every device out there should have a unique certificate or principle, and there should be nothing shared from that perspective. From the machine learning, this normally depends on the organization, but I normally see that customers will have you know, an IT organization and sort of a data science group that may be part of or, you know, IT or separately. But if you can use some of the same tooling and, uh, and approaches that they're using for doing uh, data science or machine learning, um, using those at the edge is also great. If you're using you know, TensorFlow internally, great. Um, maybe you, you focus on using TensorFlow Lite or LT at the edge. Uh, the same thing is that you're, if you're using um, you know, MXNet or CAFE, et cetera, is um, you know, using those same types of outputs or models will help you understand the, you know, it'll help you and the, the machine learning people know what's, you know, how things are happening in the cloud and then as you're actually deploying. Uh, same thing is like, you know, having a process for that, I create a model, I deploy it to the edge, I use the inference on this to actually collect data, I push some training data back to the cloud, and at that point, I can do the retraining of the model and using you know, uh, a lot of the uh, scale-out cap capabilities, then taking that trained model and putting it back onto our devices. So essentially having that sort of you know, uh, closed-looped environment for doing model deployment, model or data collection, model retraining, model deployment, et cetera. And then finally is that, and this is where it gets a little bit sort of hand-wavy, um, it depends on what your development cycle looks like in the cloud. Is a lot of times if you're using like, you know, a continuous integration, continuous deployment process, you're doing a lot of deployments on a daily basis. But if you can sort of incorporate that when developers are, you know, writing code and making commits, that that kicks off a pipeline that goes through essentially the entire process of taking that code, creating the assets, going through a testing on either, you know, virtual environment or on local testing devices, and then getting back essentially for the success or failure of a build is that essentially can demonstrate, you know, a, a pipeline that you normally use for like, you know, cloud-based or web-based applications that can be applied to edge compute components too. Um, we normally see this only when you're talking from the, the, um, the assets on up. So the, the blue box into the green boxes, but this also, you know, when you get into like full regression testing to be, all right, we're making some significant changes to the underlying operating system and we want to do a full test of, of OS, system packages, user packages, et cetera. And then of course you have different types of mechanisms for having to do deployments. Um, you, you can be one boxing this, you can do in blue greens, um, fleet deployments. But have the capability for, uh, for how you're doing both over the air updates to send out things, but also a rollback um, if necessary, as we kind of mentioned on the um, what things go wrong slide. 
All right, that's, you know, 40 minutes in and we've, we've covered a lot here. Um, but what I'd like to sort of go is just, you know, sort of, you know, wrap everything up together and sort of summarize this. So we'll go ahead and start with, you know, should you use Edge or is Edge a good use case? And I'd say that the sort of litmus test is if there's a capability out there that addresses one of the laws of, of either, you know, speed or physics, uh, cost, or, you know, from a jurisdictional or sovereignty perspective, laws of the land, you might have a good use case for that. Normally what we see is that if there's any type of machine learning that's being done at the edge, where somebody says, I want to put a camera out there and detect when somebody walks in a door, or they're not wearing their personal protection equipment, or when, um, you know, things on a manufacturing line look properly, do I have the right posture or not? Those are always, you know, sort of your good indicators that you've got a good edge case. Once you do have that, um, you know, either define and create your own or adopt existing patterns to sort of build out that full stack component. So, you know, think about the hardware, think about the operating system, uh, the uh, potential additional operating system, you know, repo packages or distribution packages you want to include, then along with how you're going to uh, orchestrate or deploy um, all of this business or edge logic that you want to uh, put onto the device. And then think about how these things are going to be deployed. You know, it's very common to see these in a uh, your test or lab environment where you connect them to a hardwired Ethernet or to a very consistent Wi-Fi. Things work fine. You then put them into a, a remote terminal unit on an oil well in you know, uh, you know northeastern you know, New Mexico, and things don't so work so well because when the sun's up, it degrades the signal quality to the point that the device can barely get a connection, and it you know it, it goes in and out. So think about those sort of intermittent capabilities. And then some of the other things that we mentioned in the gotchas uh, component uh, for, for addressing the device. And you know, I really can't stress it enough, but um, you know, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants. Take advantage of all the, the hard work that your you know, you know, IT or your operational technology, the OT departments have done for, for how they're deploying things and how they manage things too. Um, by doing that, it, it helps significantly reduce the technical debt that you might be creating for a you know, sort of a bespoke or a custom edge use case. But at the same time, is that it allows you to also have access to other resources um, for, for troubleshooting or for potentially you know, new opportunities and also keeping up to date for when they make changes that you can actually take advantage of those also. And this is sort of the, um, the, the thing you know, from, my, uh, from AWS is you know, AWS IoT Greengrass is the edge compute capability that we have that essentially addresses a lot of these um, these things we spoke about. So it essentially addresses the orchestration, uh, the ability to do container management at the edge, along with you know uh, Lambda functions, our serverless compute, everything that can be deployed onto a variety of different hardware components. And um, it also handles the machine learning, where you can train you know a machine learning model in the cloud with SageMaker, click a button and then have that automatically deployed through a set of pre, you know, prescripted uh, connectors that will do that without you having to write this actual code. And with that, I'm going to uh, open this up to Q&A. I normally, if we were together, I would uh, just you know, point to you or point to you and, and ask a question. But um, uh, one of my colleagues, Lisa Ralph, is going to uh, send questions over to me and I'll, I'll simply reread them and uh, give you answers back here. But first, it's a, a quick uh, drink here. All right. So the uh, the first question is, you know, you know, what will be the future of edge computing? Will there be any more evolution in in computing platform? And I, I think the answer to that would be, well, first of all, I, I don't really know what the, the future does hold. But if we take a look, you know, historically, what has happened is that things that are currently out there in sort of you know an innovative type of space. Um, that you're, you're looking from one particular angle or another, but they're sort of you know a one-off type of solution or one-off one type of situation, normally can either evolve into the next type of technology or they, they can essentially fade away. Um, I, I'd probably say you, know, when you keep a weather eye on, on what things are happening in the, the compute or the IT space or even the embedded Linux space in general and see where things are going. Is you know, you know, 2020 hindsight, but, but normally, you know, what we see from things such as, you know, from, from markets or from the, the analysts is that the, the explosion of IoT devices into the tens of billions that are out there is giving us a lot of capabilities at the edge from a sort of discrete component perspective. 
And now we're seeing sort of that same kind of, you know, wave of adoption happening from, you know, edge compute or, or edge capability, which isn't just compute, it's machine learning and other types of things. So a good question. So the other question, is there a way to retrain an object detection model automatically from data gathered from the edge device using SageMaker? And this is specific to AWS, but the answer is yes. So we actually have a Greengrass connector, which is called the, uh, the machine, it's a machine learning inference connector that allows for retraining. So it allows, um, it, it basically deploys the, um, the capabilities of the edge to collect data and based on certain inference values, if it sees probability dropping or, or getting, you know, um, you know, not hitting like a high confidence threshold, to be able to capture some of that data. It could be, vid it could be you know, video data or other types of, you know, um, input data that then can be pushed up to the cloud and then automated from that perspective. It does require some work and coordination for how you, um, you look to uh, create your notebook and your training model or your training approach inside of SageMaker, uh, but that is definitely doable. So the next question is, yeah, I love this one. Uh, if an app needs Python 3.6, sounds fine. Um, you know, you know, 3.8 is simply is just rolling out. Um, so, you know, should 3.8 be fine unless you're saying the Python isn't good with backwards compatibility? And that's predominantly ex exactly what it is. We, um, we see customers out there that do this. You've installed 3.6, it's like, all right, we have things that are running 3.6 and 3.8, so let's just do a symlink. So we'll, we'll symlink our 3.6 to a 3.8 environment or 3.7, uh, whatever is hard coded to, to use those particular um, paths. And 99.9% .9 of the time, things work. Where things normally break is when it comes into some of the machine learning components. Um, in the case like IoT Greengrass, we only support um, Python 3.7. So to get back to 3.6, you can do that. We can symlink our 3.7 to 3.6. And at that point, things normally work. Um, however, certain things can break when you're doing um, different operations with machine learning models or like with the SageMaker Neo uh, DLR perspective. So that's why I, um, I always like to say is, you know, spend as, as, as horrible as it can be sometimes, spend a lot of time working with your Python environments uh, specifically to see what is or isn't compatible. And that's also sort of a, you know, a good plug or a use case for that, that unit testing and that full regression testing of all the capabilities of your um, your IoT or your, um, your edge capabilities there. Let's see, so we have another question in regards to security and identity of devices in an IoT network. So the question is, are there any ongoing experiments to integrate Hyperledger Fabric capabilities? Um, Indy, uh, Ursa, Ares, uh, what is the future of blockchain, blockchain technology in IoT? Um, I am not an expert in, in blockchain overall. It is a question that we, we do hear a lot from customers, normally right now sort of in the innovation phase or steps. Um, what, I've, what I would say or what I have seen is that customers will take advantage of certain blockchain te technologies for, for source data. And this can come into things such as like in the oil and gas industry where um, data that's measured at certain um, you know, remote terminal units, uh, things for like you know, natural gas or oil extraction, there, I, there are certain values that will determine the quality or the quantity of that particular product. And that's actually, that's actually tracked uh, from source all the way through distribution. So from essentially an upstream all the way to downstream. And we have seen customers that are taking advantage of blockchain to essentially you know, ledger those types of uh, measurements there and then along the entire uh, process of when they're using the technology. Um, unfortunately, I am not that familiar with uh, some of the other um, hyperle hyperledger fabric uh, capabilities out there. Um, but it's something that, that I'm, I'm keeping an eye on too to see how that can be sort of incorporated uh, into an IoT environment. What I would say is I never, I never see that um, associated with the security or identity of a device. It's more about potentially the data that it's actually creating um, and then sort of the, um, like I said, the chain of trust or the, the chain of custody for that data as it goes through an, an actual process. So another question is, um, are there any good resources to learn edge computing? Um, and Lisa kind of answered this, um, but um, yeah, go, go to the, uh, the virtual IoT booth um, in the Gold and Silver Hall. Is, um, normally we'd have you staffed with uh, people such as myself, Solutions Architect, where you can come in and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, virtually, you can, you can kind of do that to, you know, today. And uh, so, you know, simply bring up you know, particular use cases and have sort of a one-on-one you know, -on -one or a, you know, even a one-on-many type of conversation in regards to that. 
Um, and there's also a, a great collection on the inside of the booth itself on a getting started guide. So I worked with um, some of our marketing people to essentially say, if you want to get started with Greengrass or SageMaker um, or our device SDKs or just IoT in general, there's some good sort of links there directly to our developer guides um, that will start to explain what the services do and how they operate. So another question is, um, you know, how should I compare the models for inference at the edge? Is there any tools for that? I'm, I'm going to guess that the question is more around um, the, the, the quality of a, of a particular model. Um, you know, is, is model A doing the best or is model B doing the best um, when, when you know, given a certain amount of data? And what I'd probably say is that that comes back to the more data that you can collect from the edge to use as training data um, for your, your data sets, you know, the better. Is, you know, in, in ML in general, you know, having, you know, uh, 10 or 100 samples is probably going to you know, overtrain or overfit a model quickly. A thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, um, you know, um, sets of data is better. And so that's why I'd say is that you know, if you are looking to 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 deploy training to the edge, um, a lot of times the 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 inference itself will will happen um, cloud side when you're going through the the, the the training gyrations. But then actually, when you do deploy the model. You could take sort of the, the blue green approach. If you've got your entire fleet that's running, you know, model version one, and you're getting back certain values, and from the, you know, from the cloud side, you're classifying or annotating the data as either correct or, or incorrect, and you can use something such as you say to make a ground truth for that. You may want to say, all right, for 10% of my fleet, I'm going to, you know, deploy model version two to the to the, the blue, you know, the blue fleet, if you will, and see what the differences are that comes back with that. If it's better. You can then say, all right, let's, let's go ahead and roll everybody out to version two. If it isn't, you've at least got some good data back that you can then use to make the determinate, you know, for the, for the next cycle. And uh, with that, um, they're going to be cutting us off here in a few minutes. So I'm going to take one more question. If there are any follow-ups, please go to the, uh, the database booth. Um, and also, if there are things, I'll be on the Slack channel for this, uh, this uh, track uh, later this afternoon, probably about a couple hours or so, you can answer questions there. And um, Unfortunately, that, that's going to be the last question. Uh, oh, actually, no, here's the last question. So coming from a developing country, um, how can one start edge computing easily and teach community to, um, to adopt it in their IT services? Um, I'd probably say the best approach for that is find something, find examples that are out there in the world that, that have worked and, 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 and kind of, you know, use those, um, you know, play around with those and understand what those are, but take those lessons learned and see what that actual community that you're you're looking to potentially you know um, educate or elevate may have problems with. Uh, for instance, I do um, your mission work in Haiti, and a situation there um, you think would be like you know water or power you know types of things. One of the key things there was um, they have got solar panels that they actually charge their cell their their cell phones during the day, and um, you know that could be a potential opportunity that if you've got cell you know cell sites you know spread across the country that are doing charging. And one cell is degraded or it's not pointing in the right direction. That could be a good example of, of getting some of that, that edge data, you know, the operation of, you know, how many phones are being charged, the conditions, et cetera, and be able to, uh, to, to feed that back to go out and make it adjustments or whatever. So with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, thank everybody for attending. Um, I do appreciate this. I really wish this was in person so that, you know, I give you a heartfelt thanks to everybody. But it's been my pleasure to, to go ahead and present you know, deep learnings at the edge of you know what I've gone through you know battle trained for the last couple of years and um, please enjoy the rest of the embedded uh, embedded links conference and with that uh, I think we'll go ahead and close this out